medicine. He's going to speak about the non-invasive ventilation and immunocompromised patients. Should non-invasive ventilation still be used in all immunocompromised patients? Eli. Thank you, Massimo. Good afternoon. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, well, the question is more about uh, are immunocompromised patients different than other hypoxemic patients? Uh, the question that is being asked is more about uh, applying non-invasive ventilation in hypoxemic patients. Uh, but of course, uh, as uh, the number of cancer hematotransplant patients are older, they have a large number of comorbidities. They may be with chronic cardiac uh, failure, COPD. So for these patients, obviously, non-invasive ventilation is the standard of care when they have an acute exacerbation with either a hyperbaric situation or a pulmonary edema. So can we resume the question to should an IV be the first ventilation strategy in hypoxemia? I'm not sure that anyone has the answer in the room. Should we consider immunocompromised patients uh, always dying when they are intubated? Everyone is convinced that this is not true. Or is there a reason to suggest that an IV may have specific uh, interventions and strength in immunocompromised patients, uh, and I'm not aware of this. Um, so first of all, there is one major change that explains the difference between current results and the results that have been published uh, 15 to 20 years ago. And this difference is then when a cancer, a hemato, a transplant patient becomes critically ill, mortality has decreased by about 20 to 30 percent, making the situation quite different as the number of events decreases. It is considered that a trial to demonstrate survival benefits has to include a very large number of patients. This is a typical example from a cohort data, a retrospective data from uh, the GRO group in France. Uh, you can see that uh, in a large number of patients with cancer and RDS, uh, mortality has decreased from 90% in 1990 to about 50%, which has to be considered the correct expectancies in RDS patients receiving mechanical ventilation. And still, one of the major things that makes uh, mechanical ventilation a problem is about associated conditions. When you receive mechanical ventilation and you have vasopressors and you have a renal replacement therapy and maybe you are a recipient of allogeny BMT, so then you have a problem. But still, this problem makes that mortality of intubated patients uh, in a mix uh, is 60% and does not depend on the number of days since patients are intubated, making very clear that, first of all, mortality has decreased, and the other thing is that you have time to perform mechanical ventilation and to wait for patient respond to the treatment you have implemented. For sure, we have to implement non-invasive ventilation in patients receiving procedures until new data from high flow oxygen will be available in this patient population. And uh, we have from our chairman this uh, wonderful paper published 20 years ago showing very clearly that non-invasive ventilation was able to secure a, a procedure that is believed to be useful in 20 to 30 percent of these patients, and even if there are kidney transplant or liver transplant patients, it may be useful in 70 percent of them, and you can see that the NIV has secured. And based on these data, you can see that there was a confirmation from the group from Bordeaux, Didier Gruson and Gilles Hilbert, also showing that NIV has had secured the, the, the procedure and making clear that no NIV is used in a large number of cases of bronchoscopy in hypoxemic patients in the ICU with no impact on the number of intubated patients. And you can see in this trial, patients were mostly receiving an IV during bronchoscopy, either at the time of the procedure or just before and just after. And you can see that uh, bronchoscopy had no impact on the number of patients receiving mechanical ventilation. NIV is for sure something that we should consider, we should apply in this situation, and even maybe uh, uh, could be compared to high flow oxygen uh, to get more data in this population. The other thing is about outcomes associated with uh, non-invasive ventilation. In this landmark trial published uh, 15 years ago, you can see that uh, 
at least uh, overall, but at least in the group of cancer patients, uh, you had a reduced number of patients uh, receiving mechanical ventilation, as well as a reduced mortality thanks to the, to the NIV in this study. However, you can see here that the hemato and onco patients receiving oxygen had a 93% uh, rate of mechanic intubation and mechanical ventilation, which is not the case anymore. Now it's believed to be in something like 18 studies about 40%, uh, mostly because patients are admitted much earlier to the ICU. And the other thing is that mortality of a uh, standard uh, oxygen group uh, was 87%, and you have just seen results showing that it's in between 40 to 60%. Of course, this strength of non-invasive ventilation was very clear at a time where mechanical ventilation was mostly dreadful in these patients, but may not be uh, uh, any more uh, true. Another example, in less immunocompromised patients, but they were transplant, solid organ transplant patients, uh, you can see that uh, using NIV, we had an increase from 25 to 70% of patients having oxygenation improvement, of having sustained PF ratio that were improved, uh, and also a significant reduced of intubation rate and mortality from 70 and 50% respectively to 20%. And this is my favorite uh, cohort study, which is not a randomized trial, but a very large and very well done study in immunocompromised patients, all of them having hematological malignancies. And you can see that uh, in that large period, 2000, 2006, uh, there is no doubt that at that time there was a huge uh, impact uh, on uh, intubation and survival. Still, if we want to consider the the, the weaknesses of the technique, uh, we have also to see the other part of the world. And uh, there is a very bad impact of delayed intubation in these patients, uh, and even a study showing that if you are using an IV for too long in hemato and onco patients, then you will have an increased mortality. Another thing is also dependent on the setting. And I'm sure that uh, the main difference between the squadron paper and the WORMC paper on applying an IV to allo BMT patients outside the ICU is only about culture and the presence of ICU people outside the ICU. In Italy, it seems routine to have ICU people go and round and check and help. In Germany, in that BMT transplant uh, group, uh, there were no ICU people and NIV were not useful. And I think that this makes also a big difference. Um, so to sum up with this literature, we can say that at that time, because of the changing in events and mortality, it was mostly inconclusive. Uh, and this is why we designed a trial to try to address the question. The trial was mostly made because of the, the events that were in the 90s were not any more reliable as mortality has decreased, patients are admitted earlier, and the use of intubation is much less nowadays than 20 years ago. In this trial, and I will take the opportunity to, to respond to, to the two very good comments from Paolo, in this period, for sure, we did not use NIV as a, a, an alternative to intubation. The trial was on early NIV in patients having a low PF ratio, but at least six liters of oxygen, and the median was nine liters of oxygen at randomization. And of course, they were receiving eight hours of NIV at day one, six at day two, and five at day three. More than that would question about the external validity of the trial. More than that we would say that the patients are not at an early stage of uh, acute respiratory failure. Should we do a trial, and this was a discussion that we had with Massimo Antonelli uh, recently, should we do a trial uh, of an IV in severe RDS patients uh, to uh, who have maybe indications for intubation is still non-resolved and is something that I don't recommend, but I think that it should be a matter of discussion. So in this trial, NIV was tested and compared to standard oxygen, but high flow oxygen was used 
at a clinician's decision. And we excluded, of course, those patients who were with clear benefit from NIV, uh, patients with uh, COPD and patients with acute pulmonary edema, and as well as patients with multiple organ dysfunction and those who, who needed immediate intubation. You can see that uh, 183 patients were in uh, the uh, oxygen, standard oxygen group, uh, and 191 were in the NIV group. Um, the two groups were uh, uh, with the same uh, 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 characteristics. Uh, and if we base our outcome on PA ratio at inclusion and in the following days or on the respiratory distress, we could not report any difference in these patients with early acute respiratory failure and immunocompromised situations. And as a result, you can see that uh, the mortality that was the primary endpoint was 27% with standard oxygen and 24 with NIV, and that the rate of intubation was quite higher with the standard oxygen, but it was not different. Uh, and if you question me, I would provide you with the post hoc uh, uh, power calculation. So in practice, I must say that uh, forget the red bars, because this is the real life. In the real life, you have many patients who are, who are with a DNI situation, do not intubate, and they are mixed in all the cohort studies. And this uh, OVNI trial that we did uh, with the French and the Belgian group uh, and Alexandre de Moule uh, has make, made very clear that if you take the yellow bars, uh, you can see that uh, immunocompromised patients here, mostly cancer patients, have a 50% uh, survival after NIV when they have a DNI DNI situation, uh, and in the blue bars, patients with no therapeutic limitations, uh, mortality after an NIV for acute respiratory failure, which is here only hypoxemic, is 28%. So we are with consistent data and consistent results. Um, the other thing is that I believe that in a close future, we should stop comparing binary combinations. Uh, actually, we could use everything, intubation, NIV, CPAP, BPAP, uh, any other uh, uh, material, high flow oxygen, after, before intubation, and we should mix all these uh, strategies for the good of the patient. And I'm not sure that one technique should be compared to the other. We should use a combination of techniques uh, rather than one uh, versus B. We need also to be very clear with contraindication to NIV, and this is the problem with cohort and retrospective studies, is that plenty of patients were with DNI situations, uh, unless it was stated otherwise, uh, and plenty of patients may have received uh, NIV with contraindications. Uh, and I'm uh, very pro of this study showing clearly that the severe RDS patients are poor candidates uh, to uh, NIV, even if they are not immunocompromised, and I guess that this is also true and even worse, uh, and it has been published in two papers in hemato, onco, and transplant patients. So we should keep NIV as an early strategy because the Evnictus trial published in JAMA has not demonstrated any harm from NIV. It has not demonstrated any benefit of NIV. It may discourage you to use NIV and or encourage you to test high flow oxygen. But still, I'm not pro doing 24 hours NIV per day and even more than 12 hours per day because in that case, uh, it's, not early, it's not NIV in early acute respiratory failure. It's another setting, another clinical vignette that deserves an entire trial. For the future, the use of high flow oxygen is clearly a matter of uh, uh, investigation. Uh, these retrospective data are the only one published currently in the literature, and they show that the combination of uh, high flow oxygen plus NIV provides uh, survival benefits uh, as well as uh, 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 good results in terms of uh, request to intubation. Uh, but these are uh, uh, limited data. From of good quality but quite limited uh, that need to be confirmed by other cohort studies and by trials that are uh, ongoing very soon. If we are taking uh, data from Evnictus, uh, this is another strength. If you look at the right part of the slide, you can see here that the combination of high flow plus NIV has not provided any, uh, any uh, harm, and even the, the opposite, as you can see that the number of patients intubated and their mortality was lower, but not significantly compared to the others. To conclude, uh, we can see, we can say that unrestricted use of NIV has to be applied in immunocompromised patients with hypercapnia or cardiac pulmonary edema. 
this is not a matter of discussion. We can use an IV and we do that on a daily basis to secure procedures uh, and uh, we are looking forward to having data from high flow oxygen in this education. Um, we can say very clearly that, to my opinion, an IV is not uh, an alternative to intubation in hypoxemic patients. First of all, because it may be harmful. And the other thing is that as mortality of this patient has much decreased, it's not anymore a problem to intubate them. Of course, if you can avoid, it's better. NIV should be used in patients with CV, should not be used in patients with CV or RDS and those with um, multiple organ dysfunction. And in the Evnictus trial, NIV was ineffective in patients with early acute respiratory failure, but no harm has been reported. Thank you very much.